as Coloradans drop off ballots, candidates drop out of the presidential race, leaving supporters in Denver waiting for a rally that never rallied, and had us asking whether there's any way to do over a vote for a now non-existent campaign. There are people in Denver being tested for coronavirus today. Let's get into your questions. Like, why do the experts say masks don't help if we're supposed to save the masks for healthcare workers? And I'm going to ask you to make some preparations based on facts, not fear. And then we will get away from the, the politics and the possible pandemic on Earth. We will get way away from it. I think when teachers live what um, they teach, they, the students get excited with them. Here we go. Next. The Clovo surge sputtered to a stop in Colorado today. Presidential campaigns campaign until the minute they don't. When Senator Amy Klobuchar left the race for president midday today, she left supporters in Denver waiting outside of a rally that never started. Some had already early voted for Klobuchar. Some had not. Uh, Senator suspended her campaign. So when did you when did you hear? Just when we, we just arrived. Up into the parked the car and somebody said, oh, well, the, she's canceled. I'm surprised she dropped out and didn't wait to see what the results were for tomorrow. I turned in my ballot yesterday to the Boulder County Clerk and Recorder's Office. But I am a Democrat, so I, I'll go with the party. And now that Amy has dropped out, I'm going to vote for Biden. Yeah, I, I waited purposely. And it's a good thing we did, because our vote would have been wasted. Voters have been asking us all weekend if there's any way to undo a ballot cast for a candidate who has left the race. A spokesman for Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold told me this morning it was theoretically possible for a voter to come and vote in person before their mail ballot gets in to be counted. Hours later, Griswold's office backtracked, saying that, that method would be theoretically possible, but theoretically not legal. Griswold ignored that fact that the misinformation came from her own office when she tried to blame media outlets. You are not allowed to cast two ballots that are voted. Um, and we have seen, including uh, by some news media, uh, that there's misinformation out there and we are trying to correct the record to make sure that people are following the law and having their voice heard. Here's the deal. I apologize for reporting the answer that was given to us by the Secretary of State's office. We, I incorrectly assumed that the Office of Colorado's Chief Elections Officer would be a reliable source of information on elections. And ultimately, anything we report is on us and me as journalists. We'll not make that error again with Secretary Griswold's office. So let's go back to the original question raised by next viewers. Colorado's early voting is convenient, but it can trap voters who have picked a candidate who then leaves the race before the votes are counted. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. Maybe you dropped off your ballot having voted for Pete Buttigieg. Oops. Perhaps you turned in yours for Amy Klobuchar. Ugh. It's democracy. Democracy is a messy business. Why, if you voted for a candidate who has suspended their campaign, can you not take that vote back and try again? Once a ballot is cast, it is cast. Once you voted and you've turned that in, you voted. It's because no one tracks who you voted for, just that you did vote. One of the core things in making sure an election is transparent and it's fair is making sure that there's voter anonymity. When your ballot is received, the envelope with a barcode that identifies you gets scanned. Then the ballot is taken out. Then it gets separated. Then this one gets tabulated um, and counted. The ballot, which goes through its own processing, has no identifying numbers or marks tying it back to you. The clerk only knows that you voted, not who you voted for. So there's no way to override your vote, except if you still have not turned in your ballot. Those directions describing how to cross out and pick again are at the top of your ballot. What you do is you cross out the entire name that you marked as a mistake, so whatever one you feel was your mistake, and then completely fill the oval to the left of the corrected choice. This looks like a bad test, but this is a legitimate way to vote. If you voted for every candidate at some point who is now out, you just have to cross it out like that and eventually circle just one that doesn't have a crossed out mark. So that will count in all of Colorado. Only two people, John Delaney and Michael Bennett, have submitted the proper paperwork mm -hmm. so that their votes won't count, but to 
make this even more confusing, the Democratic Party, if any of these candidates get enough support, 15% or more, they're still eligible for delegates, whether they say they're still running or not. And I guess that might be some kind of a consolation prize for, say, a Pete Buttigieg or Amy Klobuchar supporter. If they reach that viability threshold, it'll be up to them what to do with those delegates, and, and their wishes may be honored in the end, the candidates. True, but it's up to the delegate to decide what to do. Just because a candidate says, I now support this person, sure. and I endorse this person, that doesn't mean the delegate has to follow that lead. Sorry, Amy. You left me sitting outside that rally in Denver. I don't know if I'm going to listen to you. It's an interesting situation. All right. Thank you, Marshall. Colorado still does not have an officially confirmed case of COVID-19 coronavirus. Today, Denver Mayor Michael Hancock came out to say that three potential cases in Denver are being tested right now. Six more potential cases around the state are being tested. Hancock said that 23 statewide came back as negative. But do not be fooled into thinking that the virus won't come here. So we need to be turning our attention to preparation. Mayor Hancock was asked about his powers to quarantine zones within the city. In the city of Denver, we have the ability to, in partnership and consultation with the public health officer, Bob McDonald, uh, to restrict, restrict areas that uh, we deem might be a public health threat. Um, and so we can do that. The mayor says that DIA is not one of the 20 airports nationwide selected for passenger screening for COVID-19. Expanded testing is the way that we're going to know about the current extent of the virus here. State health workers say the state's lab can now test 160 samples a day. Tonight's question comes from a viewer named Bob, who sees a disconnect in the media reports where medical experts are saying that face masks don't really do much to prevent the spread of the coronavirus, while at the same time saying those masks need to be saved for health care workers. It's a very good question, Bob. We reached out to our me medical expert, Dr. Pyle Coley, for the answer on this, and here's what she told us. First off, the masks are just part of the full protective gear that healthcare workers would wear when working with somebody thought to have COVID-19. And not all masks are equal. Healthcare workers will wear N95 masks. They work best with a fit test, as well as proper training on how to wear them correctly. Surgical masks, on the other hand, are not effective protection against something like COVID-19. Those surgical masks protect against large droplets from a sneeze or something, but not smaller ones. And the people who are not used to wearing masks, doctors found, tend to touch their faces more when they wear one. It can counteract the benefits and provide a false sense of security. Dr. Coley also mentioned that healthcare workers need those masks for a variety of risk scenarios. Coronavirus is only one of them. What about ism seems to be spreading as fast as the virus these days? We keep seeing people trying to deflect from the risk of coronavirus or its political implica implications by mentioning the flu. And yes, the seasonal flu kills tens of thousands of people each year. As our Steve Steger found out, there is a reason why the coronavirus has created a different sense of urgency. <laughs> What about the flu, you ask? So far this year, the CDC estimates there have been at least 32 million cases of the flu, resulting in at least 18,000 deaths, a far lower number than the current 43 confirmed cases and six deaths associated with coronavirus in the U.S. Flu is a, is a known devil. We've had the flu around for many, many years. We understand how it works. We have vaccines to prevent the flu. Nine News medical expert Dr. Pyle Coley says there's a reason it's getting so much more attention. With the coronavirus, it's an unknown devil. So there's so little that we know about it. It's a rapidly evolving situation and we're learning very quickly about it. The preliminary study of coronavirus, predominantly in China, found its death rate around 2%. That's high compared to the seasonal flu, which is usually around one-tenth of 1%. Though a wider study of coronavirus patients found a lower mortality rate, about 1.4%. And Dr. Anthony Fauci with the National Institutes of Health says that rate is likely to go down as more mild cases of coronavirus are diagnosed. We're still learning about how it's spread. We think it's respiratory droplets, but there could be other sources of spread as well. That's just it. There is so much we don't know and don't have. There's no antiviral treatment for it yet. No vaccine. That's part of this process, Dr. Coley says, and why we should be paying attention. It's an inevitable part of evolution that we face new diseases. 
The flu and coronavirus are different in many ways, including the impacts on kids. Now, that initial study of the disease in China found kids infected by this tend to only have minor symptoms, Kyle, where the flu really impacts kids and can even kill kids. We have to stress to people that because this novel strand has only really been studied in China so far, Everything we know about it comes from China, like the fact that it disproportionately affected men there, but there are cultural issues. Yes. In, in fact, even the susceptible particles in the lung, uh, it's found that people in Asia might actually have more of those particles in their lungs, Dr. Coley told us today. So that's one of those things that it's such a small sample of people right now as it widens out and more studies uh, come in, we'll start to get a better idea of how this disease impacts And everyone. so many men in China smoke, whereas women in China tend not to. Obviously, things are, are different here stateside. Keep, keep looking at the best research and give people those facts. All right. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Our promise to you as we cover COVID-19, the coronavirus, is to focus on facts, not fear. The facts tell us that we should be preparing now for inevitable cases in Colorado and for the potential of community transmission. You've heard the obvious stuff, washing hands, coughing in your elbow, staying home if you're sick. The CDC and the Red Cross say we need to do more, and we shouldn't avoid talking about this stuff just because it's uncomfortable. They say that we should have a supply of food and household supplies ready so that you can stay home with your family if sick or quarantined. Stay there for a while. Identify an area in your home with a bathroom, if possible, that could be used by somebody who's sick. Gather up at least a month's worth of your medications, prescriptions, as well as over-the-counter meds, plus drinks with electrolytes. Have those on hand. Prepare for kids to be out of school for a time and think about who would take care of vulnerable people in your family, like older relatives, if they're asked to recover at home. And at work, we can begin cross-training where possible so that coworkers can cover for each other so that sick employees can stay home. This is not about fear. Smart preparation now, based on the facts, can reduce fear. At least we'll know that we are as ready as we can be for an uncertain situation. CDOT's motto is to keep plowing until the roads are clear, unless you live on one sixth of Colorado's roads. Then you need to wait for business hours. I've been chomping at the bit to talk about it with my students. Uh, only my immediate family and uh, the administration knew. He no longer has to keep that secret that he's headed where no Colorado teacher has gone before. That's next. There are people who commute from rural Washington County all the way into Denver each day. That is a pretty serious drive. Republican State Rep Richard Holter knows it well. And it got him thinking that CDOT could adjust how it plows rural roads. CDOT is in charge of clearing about 26,000 miles of roads in Colorado. It's had a standing policy since the 1980s that crews work 24 hours a day clearing any road that sees 1,000 vehicles or more in a day. Those are the busiest roads that you see there in red on the map. There are about 5,700 miles of state roads that don't meet that traffic threshold. More than 1,500 miles of those, what you see highlighted in yellow, has a special waiver that they also get 24-hour plowing. And that's because of a nearby hospital or school. So that leaves 4,144 miles of roads in our state that are only plowed within a 14-hour window. Right now, that's 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. The proposed bill would expand that window to 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. And it would cost about $1.5 million each year. wintry start to the day about one to four inches across the Denver metro area this afternoon. The sunshine was out, felt a bit more like spring. Tonight we have a few clouds sitting over the region, but the winds, they have just been fierce out there, especially around the foothills through Blackhawk, 50 plus mile per hour wind gusts, and then taking you up toward Wyoming and Cheyenne, a pretty blustery evening out there too. Tonight, those clouds should move out. We'll be back in business with clear skies, temperatures falling to the mid 50s. 20s here tonight. 20s across the plains, single digits and teens going up in the mountains, but high pressure is around. So the storm track stays to our north, stays to our south. So we have a, another couple of mild and dry days ahead. Tomorrow, plenty of sunshine and the warm up begins. How about 56? We'll be in the 60s across the eastern side of the state with 30s and 40s up in the mountains. 62 with mostly sunny skies on Wednesday. A quick front rolls through Thursday. It doesn't bring us any rain or snow, just a quick cool off, but still pleasant. And then heading toward the weekend. Wow, close to 70 degrees on Saturday. Right now it looks like our next storm rolls in Sunday night into Monday.
He is ready to experience what he teaches. I love astronomy. Like seriously, astronomy has been a huge passion my whole life. And I, I'm not just saying that because it sounds cliche. It actually has been. A hands-on experience that's likely to be white knuckle. Next. Great teachers like Bob MacArthur at Highlands Ranch High School teach through experiences. And man, is he about to get one. At 43,000 feet, our Byron Reed met a teacher on a mission. So, there you go. For the past few months, <laughs> Bob MacArthur's managed to hold on to a secret. So I've been so excited. I've been chomping at the bit to talk about it with my students. He's a teacher at Highlands Ranch High School. I teach astronomy, geology, meteorology, earth science. Educating students on a subject that's been a passion his whole life. I love astronomy. Like, seriously. I remember my dad. He probably stuck my head up to an eyepiece of a telescope when I was like a baby. So after he found out the good news he's had to hold on to for so long, MacArthur's love of space reached new heights. Still sit here and go, oh my gosh, I actually get to do this. It's about why you would want to put a telescope on a plane. He was selected to serve as an ambassador in NASA's Airborne Astronomy Program that gives high school teachers hands-on experiences in infrared astronomy. They also take part in a research flight on NASA's Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, or SOFIA. And it's a 100-inch telescope in the back of a 747, and you're up there flying around all night doing various research. Well, flying at 45,000 feet, you get above 90% of the water vapor, which allows SOFIA to observe infrared light from space. He's one of 28 teachers chosen nationwide and the first ever selected from Colorado. I've been teaching for 18 years and it's exciting to do new things to, to keep my education going, but also to bring those experiences that I'm learning back into the classrooms. Now, Igneous Rock. Now, MacArthur can finally share the news of the experiences he'll bring back to Colorado. I'll be taking video, taking pictures. To help answer the questions of the unknown. I think when teachers live what um, they teach, it, the students get excited with them. For next? To represent Colorado. I mean, that's such a cool opportunity and really neat honor. I'm Byron Reed. Bob's story reminded me in a way of NASA's old teacher in space program from the 1980s, which of course ended when Chris McAuliffe, a teacher, was among those killed in the Challenger explosion. NASA told us today that they no longer seek out teachers to go into outer space, but they said a teacher with the right qualifications could always apply for astronaut training. The perfect hiking buddy. It's the most Colorado thing we saw today. That and your feedback now via text. Next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a dedicated hiking companion. Alpacas are great pack animals. This one doesn't appear to be carrying its load. Uh, next viewer named Sean spotted one on a hike near Dawson Butte Trail outside Castle Rock on Saturday. Now, I have previously misidentified alpacas as llamas and vice versa on next before. So we sent these photos to an alpaca ranch near the Springs for verification. They told us that it looks more like an alpaca than a llama, but they noted that it could be a bit of both because llamas and alpacas are known to bow chicka wow wow and create hybrids. You learn something new on this program every day. Uh, a text came in tonight, love that text hotline, boy do I ever, about our coverage of Secretary of State Griswold. Funny, informative, and honest. I'm sure that office and many Democrats now hate you, which means you are doing your job correctly. And Barbara says, why does the media blow every virus out of proportion and cause hysteria? I hope you didn't hear hysteria here, Barbara, but text us if you did.